Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com and celebrity spokesmodel for the ClassicsToday.com merchandise shop, which you can visit via the link at the bottom of the description of this video. Today, I want to have a little chat. I want to tell you about one of the stranger experiences I had in my peregrinations through the wacky world of classical music and academia and how they intersected at the time in 1983 when the Hitler Diaries were published. Now, this is a very interesting and contorted story. So let us start at the beginning, shall we? First, the musical angle. I was the classical music director, the program director of WJHU Radio in Baltimore, which at that time was a student-run radio station that had just been approved for a power increase to 25,000 watts, and it later became part of Maryland Public Radio and all of this other stuff, and then was eventually sold by the university. But at that time, we were a very, uh, shall we say, cowboys and and Indians, Wild West kind of radio station. We did all kinds of crazy stuff, and it was a lot of fun. It really was. And I had, in addition to organizing all of the other DJs and, and taking care of classical programming, I had my own shows, and of course I had to fill in whenever anyone didn't show up, which, because these were students, happened fairly frequently. So, I had a morning show, and my morning show was not your typical classical radio morning show because I was very hardcore and really pretty obnoxious. I mean, some people would say I'm still pretty obnoxious and I had no holds barred classical music in the mornings. You know how most classical mornings, you know, oh, it's your morning commute and they play Vivaldi and the Pachelbel Canon 400 times and little sniglets and excerpts and things like that. I, I was not for that. My typical morning program began with Strauss's Electra, all of it, for example. And I would, you know, wrap it up with something like Shostakovich's 14th Symphony or the 15th String Quartet, you know, Alan Pedersen, anything I could get my hands on that would like grab you by the throat and make you happy that your commute was going to be over soon. One of my favorite morning pieces, my very favorite morning pieces was Tippett's opera, The Midsummer Marriage, because it really filled up the, <laughs> the whole two and a half hours, including the news break and all that. It was just it was just fabulous. It was perfect for that sort of thing. So my morning show was not your typical morning show. Let's just put it that way. But one day I was playing Brahms. In fact, I was playing the Brahms Academic Festival Overture with Zubin Mehta and the Israel uh, the Israel, the New York Philharmonic. And in those days, I wasn't a big Brahms fan. I really wasn't, but I needed something that filled up the time and I stuck it on. And I remember thinking to myself, my goodness, this is a lively, enjoyable piece of music, much more lively than I remember it. Well, the reason for that was because I played it at 45 RPM instead of 33. But, you know, eventually I figured that out. The point is during the break, the news break after the Brahms, the very quick and zippy Brahms, my phone rang in the studio and I picked it up and the voice on the other side was a woman of obviously German origin. Now, I uh, will not use her real name. I was going to call her Ava Brown, you know, because that's sort of her model, but I, let's change it to Ava Grün. Let's make her green instead of brown because her first name was Ava. So she says to me, Is this Mr. Hurwitz of the Johns Hopkins University? Well, I said, yes, it is I. And she said, well, this is Eva Grün. And every morning I play your radio in my office and you are making me crazy. And I said, well, what's the problem? She said, well, you play, you play too much Jew music. Well, that stopped me completely in my tracks. And I said, what are you talking about? You play, you play this, this opera. I said, but Strauss wasn't Jewish. She said, it is Jew music. And now you play Brahms. I said, Brahms wasn't Jewish. 
She said, yes, but all of his friends were. It is Jew music. I want you to stop. You have to stop. Well, I, I didn't know what to say. I just basically said, sure, anything you want, dear. And I hung up the phone because I wasn't going to deal with her. Well, after that, she called me back. Every morning I was on the air to complain about the excess of Jew music that I was playing, no matter what it was, it didn't matter. So finally, one day, I did a tribute to Leonard Bernstein, where I played all Leonard Bernstein's music, and I dedicated it to Eva Grün on the air, just to see what would happen. I thought that would be amusing. And of course, the phone lit up instantly, and she's screaming at me, how dare you, how dare you play Bernstein? How can you play Bernstein? He was a Jew. And, oh my God, it was just horrendous. So this is the background to the story I'm about to tell you because this intersected with my academic life in the most amusing way. By 1983, she had called me about 450 times, and we actually had, you know, sort of begun chatting rather amusingly. She had a daughter named, named Pam, who was studying morphology, and she wanted me to borrow books from the school library, as if she thought that we were now friends. And it was really kind of frightening. But in any case, 1983 was the year, I don't know if you'll remember this one, that the Hitler diary scandal broke. Now, just to summarize, some of you may be too young to remember this, but in 1983, Stern magazine purchased for millions of dollars and with arrangements for publication in periodicals and journals all over the world, what purported to be 60 volumes of journal entries in journals written by Der Führer himself. And this caused an enormous stir, especially in the historical world. Now, I was studying German history. I was a German historian. I was, I was in a BA MA program and was completing my master's thesis on the Hindemith affair, Der Fall Hindemith, the Hindemith Fort Wengler controversy. That was my, my first master's thesis. And and my professor was a delightful, marvelous, wonderful, warm, and and intelligent, and just a, a, what, what a professor should be. His name was Vernon Litke, and his specialty was actually um, socialist workers' movements in, in pre-World War II Germany. That was what he basically did. But when the Hitler diary scandal broke, um, Everybody wanted an opinion. And this was a big deal in academia because they had been authenticated by none other than Hugh Trevor Roper, who was like Baron something or whatever. He was one of these these British bullshitters is what he was. He was extremely eminent. He was a professor at Oxford. He loved to get involved in all kinds of controversy uh, on, on topics that sometimes he knew something about and sometimes he didn't. He fancied himself a student of Hitler's Germany. One of his books was, I think, Hitler's Last Year or something like that, it was called. Anyway, he basically had antagonized virtually everyone in the, in the field, um, especially the quieter, more serious scholars. And he authenticated these things. And uh, to his everlasting disgrace, he authenticated these things. Then he had to change his mind later, which kind of besmirched his career, as they say in the biz, and uh, uh, gave rise to a tremendous amount, as being German historians, of schadenfreude in the profession. But anyway, so Trevor Roper had said these things were authentic. And Everything was astir. This was the spring of 1983, just before my graduation. And my professor was asked by local radio news to give an interview on the authenticity of the Hitler diaries. So he, of course, agreed. I mean, you know, most academics, you know, they work in the shadows and nothing they do makes any difference unless, of course, you are a scholar of Bruckner. <laughs> yeah him, in which case 
you do whatever you can to get your your the junk that you make performed by actual orchestras and people. But this was different. This was real history done by real historians. And he did an interview on local television. And so he had, you know, he, he and his wife put together a dinner uh, for all of us to come and watch the evening news um, with him and see, you know, the interview, because we were all excited about it. We thought it was going to be just fabulous. And he, 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 I don't know, it was such a letdown. That's all I can say. He had very, very good points as to why he thought they were, they were fake. The, the, his argument, and this was before they had been authenticated or anything. No one had seen them. No one had done any forensic analysis. So it was impossible to really say for sure. But he was, he, his surmise was that they could not possibly have been authentic because, first of all, they were so voluminous that he couldn't figure out when Hitler could possibly have written them. And second of all, and perhaps most tellingly, um, you know, they would not, Hitler did not actually write a lot personally. He dictated everything. Even Mein Kampf was dictated while he was, you know, in prison. He didn't write it himself personally. And then there were some other issues involving, you know, provenance and, and you know, other things he had. So he had all of his arguments lined up. But of course, this being television news, they only had like 30 seconds for the story. They interviewed him for something like 10 minutes. You know how that works. So they say, Professor Vernon Litka of the Johns Hopkins University. And you see, and they're doing all of the voiceover work. And the voiceover is happening while they're interviewing him. You see his mouth moving. You see the reporter's mouth moving. They're doing this. They're doing this. And then you see the reporter nodding because he's saying things that are presumably wonderful. We're like, what is he saying? What is he saying? And finally, he says... And fourthly, he says, and he makes this point about, about the uh, fact that Hitler did most of his heavy-duty writing by dictation, not personally. Well, no sooner does that little clip air on the local news than his phone rings. And, and he picks up the phone, and we can all hear it. We, we can all hear the voice on the other end of the phone. It's this screechy, shrill voice saying, This is Ava Grun. Is this Professor Vernon Litke of the Johns Hopkins University? And he says, Yes, it is. And she says to him, Well, I saw you on the news and I wanted to tell you, you are wrong. You know nothing about the Fuhrer. Nothing at all. The fact is, he did not, he did not dictate his writings because... We didn't have dictaphone machines in those days. Click. She hangs up the phone. And I had been, over the past year, explaining, trying to explain to my professor and colleagues in the German history department at Johns Hopkins University that I had been dealing with this crazy woman um, at the radio station. And they were laughing about it. You know, they thought I was making the whole thing up. And he just looked at me and he said... Well, the diaries may not be real, but Eva Grun, unfortunately, truly is real. It was unbelievable. She was the real deal. And eventually, of course, I graduated and I have no idea what became of her. And that was the end of it. But in the event, of course, the Hitler diaries turned out to be false, they turned out to be fake. And I mean, the, the guy who forged them was imprisoned and he actually got out of prison and then made a living selling fake um, Salvador Dali paintings, which he autographed himself. Um, and, and finally died around like the year 2000. Hugh Trevor Roper was permanently permanently quasi-disgraced. I mean, you know, it, 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 it was he was too eminent for anybody to really hold him accountable because that would mean that everybody down the line, including Oxford, had basically screwed up by putting their faith in this guy. And of course, nobody could admit that. So they kind of papered it over. And he died around 2003, 2004. But that was my encounter with the Hitler diaries via the crazy woman at the radio station, WJHU. And I just went back to playing my totally insane and things to wake you up with morning program on the air. So I thought you might 
be interested in hearing that little tale. It was a real moment for me anyway. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks for joining me. And thank you so much for letting me share this crazy stuff with you. It's really, it's really something else, isn't it? Take care.